Good evening. Tonight, as you heard, I'm going to talk with you about cancer. But before I do that, I want to know how many people in this audience have been affected by cancer, know someone with cancer, or have a relative with cancer. Raise your hand. That's not surprising. And the reason that it's not surprising is because one in three men who live to be age 70 or older will develop cancer, and one in four women will develop cancer if they live to age 70. There are 1.7 million new cases of cancer in the United States every year. And, unfortunately, 600,000 deaths per year in the United States. We have to do better. I began my journey treating cancer and thinking about cancer as a medical student. I saw a woman die of ovarian cancer, and I can close my eyes and see that woman today. And I decided, as a medical student, that I wanted to be a gynecologic oncologist. That's a mouthful. But what I do for a living is I take care of women with cancer, and specifically ovarian cancer, but also cancers of the reproductive tract. Ovarian cancer is our Achilles heel. It is the most lethal of all of the gynecologic cancers. It is extremely challenging. And the reason that it's challenging is because of where it is and the fact that it becomes resistant. And so what I mean by that is you give the patient the treatment, the chemotherapy, and she goes into a remission. But inevitably, more than 80% will recur. We have to do better. So why the challenge? Well, the ovaries live in a protected area. It's a sanctuary. It's the peritoneal cavity, and I'm kind of outlining it for you. It's where your liver, where your intestines, and if you're a woman, your ovaries live. And so that is an area that is very hard to treat. We have found through many studies that if you give the chemotherapy as a belly bath, that is, as a wash in the peritoneal cavity, you will improve your survival rate. The challenge, how do you get it there? When you put in a catheter, remember I said the bowels live there, the intestines live there? We get into complications with the bowel and the intestines. The patients get horribly toxic, and it just doesn't work in most patients. And those that can get through it, they live longer. So we have a challenge. We have to have a better treatment. The other limit to treatment is the normal cells. When you think of a patient with cancer, what do you think of? You think of a patient without hair, who's lost weight, who suffers from nausea and vomiting, and that's because the chemotherapy that we have today affects not only the cancer cells, but the good cells. So your hair falls out. You get nauseous because it affects your brain and the nausea center. So we need more precise therapy. We need more targeted therapy. And President Obama, in 2015, launched the Precision Medicine Initiative, $215 million earmarked for cancer and other diseases, but earmarked for precision therapy. So what does that have to do with FIU? Well, in my role as Executive Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, I am in charge of research. And one day, I met an engineer, Dr. Sakrat Kisroth, and he came into my office with another outstanding scientist, Dr. Madhavan Nair, and they wanted to tell me about a really exciting therapy, and it had to do with Parkinson's disease. It had nothing to do with ovarian cancer. But my job is research, and I need to know about all of the research. So they started to tell me about a special smart particle, a nanoparticle. 
and they could inject this nanoparticle into a vein, and with a magnet, they could draw it through the blood-brain barrier to the brain, and they could deliver a shock to a patient with Parkinson's who otherwise would have had to go through surgery to get the same therapy. This, for me, was an aha moment, and I didn't tell them at the time, but I really stopped listening to the shock therapy and the Parkinson's because my brain went to cancer, and my brain went to the peritoneal cavity. I was thinking, if they could drag this to the brain, they could drag this to the peritoneum, and we would get rid of the catheters, and we would improve the therapy and improve the outcome and survival. And if it was as precise in the brain as it could be in, in to cancer, then we would reduce the toxicity to normal cells. Okay. So after the meeting with Carolyn, my teammates and I have been very inspired to develop a nanotechnology to treat cancer. Our team is made of experts of very different scientific backgrounds. Chemistry, physics, mathematics, biology, engineering, computer science. And of course then we immediately got a new teammate, a Carolyn, oncology expert. I will tell you about our technology, I will tell you how it is different from conventional technologies <clears throat> and why it's different from other technologies. Today's science to study, to find cure for cancer can be divided into three different fields, biology, chemistry, and physics. Biology and chemistry deals with cancer at a relatively high level, while physics tries to understand cancer at the most basic, at the root level of the cancer. Interestingly, most of the research today is done at the levels of biology and chemistry, in other words, at high levels. Very little research is done at the physics level. Nevertheless, today we have the, the progress, especially over the last decade in treating cancer, is very impressive. Today, there are so many uh, treatments to treat cer certain cancers. Nevertheless, major open questions remain. And probably the most important fundamental question of cancer research is, the, is due to the fact that each treatment today is limited to a few cancers. Because it's developed at the chemistry and biology level, again, it's a high level. It's very impressive, but it's a high level treatment. <clears throat> it's, it cannot be easily extended, applied to all the cancers. So this is the gap we try to fill in at FIU. To achieve this goal, we used special nanoparticles. Like Carolyn mentioned, smart nanoparticles. These particles, in a way, actually, they're bilingual nanoparticles, you can say. They speak two languages. The first language is electricity. It's the language understood by the cellular microenvironment. Interestingly, cancer cells and normal cells have very different electric properties. And these particles can actually distinguish cancer cells from normal cells because they speak that language at the atomic level. They know exactly where the cancer cells are. They know exactly where the normal cells are. The other language they speak is the language of magnetism. Magnetism is the language understood by our medical machines for, we use for treatment, for diagnostic today in everyday clinical environment. So in, in a way, these particles, uh, you can say they pave a pathway for us to communicate with the cellular microenvironment at the atomic, at the most basic fundamental level. Uh, communicate, in this case, it means we can control the cellular microenvironment. And control means we can cure cancer at, at the basic level. 
which is something which cannot be done today with the state-of-the-art chemistry-based approaches. Here you see a high-level animation which illustrates the difference between our technology and conventional state-of-the-art chemistry-based technologies. The bottom image, the bottom movie is a uh, FIU-developed technology, and the top one is a conventional chemistry-based approach. The white cells are normal cells, and the red cells are cancer cells. It's a generic example which shows a tumor development in a tissue, in a generic tissue. And uh, the little dots, which are going to uh, the greenish color, the greenish-yellowish color, uh, color, they represent drug delivery mechanisms. And see the key difference here. Illustration is very good. The, uh, the bottom image, the drug is delivered in the cancer cells only. That's exactly what we want. And it's done because uh, non these nanoparticles communicate with the cells at the most fundamental level. And in the top movie, the cells go not only in the cancer cells, the, the particles, the drug, but also in the normal cells, so, which we obviously don't want. That results in side effects, and the side effects we all know, hair loss, nausea, what Carolyn was talking about, and others. These particles are very small. They are only 30, the largest particles we use are only 30 nanometers in diameter. They are so small, they can remain unnoticed by our immune system for sufficiently long time for the treatment to take place. So, over the last two or three years, we have conducted comprehensive animal studies to compare our approach to the, to the state-of-the-art chemistry-based approaches. And we used uh, specially in genetic, it's called, uh, called genetically engineered mice with uh, ovarian carcinoma xenografts inoculated in them. And imagine how excited we were to see that the only mice which were completely cured of cancer in the end of the treatment were the mice treated by FIU technology. And we also can see that no particles, no drug is ever delivered in the normal cells. So no collateral damage, no side effects. And we pretty much can load the, uh, the particles with any amount of drug to completely eradicate cancer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So this was a wow moment. We looked at this mouse, we autopsied this mouse, and there was no cancer. There was no ovarian cancer. So we cured ovarian cancer, but in a mouse model. And now we need to go to larger animals and then to human clinical trials. But we are hoping that we will impact not only ovarian cancer, but we can tag the smart particle to any current chemotherapy, biologic, or immunologic agent and directly target it. This is really exciting. So you'll remember at the beginning, I asked all of you, do you know someone? Have you personally been affected by cancer? And now what I'd like you to do is close your eyes and imagine a world free of the fear of cancer. And I think we've started on that road. Thank you. <laughs>